Okay. Welcome to the Run Radio Podcast. My name is Trendall Wilcox. My guest today is Michelle Rickman. Welcome. Hello. Thank you for having me. You guys might have heard Michelle Rickman before. She's been on the station giving ideas and thoughts so you can do your business better to the contributor corner, Michelle Rickman Coaching. But today we're going to talk about something a little bit different. We have something in common in that... I myself and a family member and your family members have chronic conditions that they deal with. And so one of the reasons I've been wanting to talk more about chronic conditions on this podcast is because someone everywhere is touched by such a small degree of separation by a chronic condition, whether it's themselves, someone they know, et cetera, et cetera, whether they're a caretaker, a medical professional, Someone is usually in the know to some degree about how chronic illness, chronic conditions of some sort impact lives. So I would like for you to tell us your experience with them. So um, my experience is uh, my two oldest kids. So I have three kids. Um, I have my son, Kyle, is 25. Uh, my daughter, Sarah, is uh, 22, and then my daughter, Anna, is 21. And my two oldest, Kyle and Sarah, are a late diagnosis for cystic fibrosis. So um, they were actually diagnosed when they were 14 and 12. Uh, most kids are diagnosed by the time they're four. So uh, we did not know <laughs> at all. Uh, so basically, they'd been living with this genetic condition. Uh, and once they were diagnosed, everything made sense, but mm -hmm. all the little things that they were struggling with and having problems with, we did not know that it was CF. Um, and so for those who don't know, CF is a genetic, chronic, life-threatening condition. It is, um, basically, uh, the CFTR gene in their body does not know how to handle salt, sodium chloride, the way that it's supposed to, which causes all of the mucus in their body to be three to four times thicker than it should be, uh, which causes most people equate it with a lung disease, which it does affect the lungs because that's where we have the most <laughs> mucus or where we think about it, but it all goes through our entire digestive tract. So, um, it causes them to, uh, have lung issues. Um, so my daughter has a lot of lung problems, uh, a lot of breathing issues. Um, it also affects your liver, your pancreas, um, absorption. So you don't absorb nutrients the way that you should, uh, you dehydrate easier than others. And while it's not autoimmune, because your body is always fighting, um, you tend to be more susceptible to other things. So just a little bit about that. So right and off, you would, you would think, oh, just eliminate your sodium, but it's not that simple, is it? No, it's not. Actually, they have to have more salt. So um, the problem is that their body does not process the salt in their system. Uh, the way that it should and the salt in our system helps to thin the mucus mm. throughout our body so that the mucus can work effectively and in their case um, that does not happen so we have to add salt to their diet every opportunity that we can um, when they sweat when they're outside when they were little and they were playing they would get the white salt rings <laughs> around their face um, my son, if he drives my car, when I get in behind him and I go to touch the steering wheel, it's gritty from the oh salt in the system. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Wow. So, so we have to constantly add the salt for them. Okay. So really when you were talking about their diagnosis, the first thing that came to my thought, my mind was how that impacted you. What was that like as a mom thinking, oh my gosh, a late diagnosis in both my children how did that get by me? What was your first reaction when you're like, how? Wow. It was um, overwhelming, terrifying, because 
Uh, everything that I knew about CF at that time was a death sentence for one thing. Um, I felt guilty. I had a huge amount of guilt. Um, it was so overwhelming. How could we have missed this? How did we not know? What if now, if we'd have known um, things might be better, maybe they wouldn't have problems that they have. You just, it's devastating. I told somebody, it was almost like um, I had my two wonderful, perfect children health-wise and somebody took them away and brought them back and broke something in them, which isn't true because they no. were born with it. <laughs> but uh, life as we knew it just completely turned upside down. And so that was, I hate using big words like devastating because I think that that's hyperbole sometimes, but I do feel like it was devastating to, mm -hmm. to all of us to just suddenly be told that we have to change our whole life around. But just that fear of not knowing, not being informed. How far apart were they diagnosed? Well, my son was the first diagnosis. Um, it was a strange thing that happened. Um, so my son has had migraines most of his life off and on. And uh, he hadn't had them for a while. But the neurologist had told us that usually in boys around 14, they might start coming back just because of hormonal fluctuations. And sure enough, he started having migraines again. And I took him to the neurologist. Well, he hadn't been in a while and our neurologist had retired. So we were seeing the gentleman who had taken his place and we're in the exam. So this is for his migraines. We're in the exam and this doctor was looking at his uh, neurological function, like doing the touch your nose and things like that. And turned around and asked me if um, anybody had ever brought up cystic fibrosis with my son. And I, I was like, wait, wait, we're here for brain stuff. How does lung stuff fit into this? Um, oddly enough, though, it had been brought up when my son was two, but then it was taken off the table because what he was struggling with got better. So um, he said it was the clubbing in Kyle's fingers, uh, his fingernails are not like ours. So like my fingernails, you know, taper, most people's do. Um, his look like he has little clubs on the end of his okay. fingers and his toes. And he asked me, the doctor asked me if anybody else in the family had that because it can be a hereditary shape. And I said, just my daughter. And, uh, he immediately explained that clubbing in fingers and toes is most frequently like 80% to 90% or higher an indicator of something um, that is uh, respiratory based or heart oh. cardiologically based. Yeah. And he said, um, he said, for example, the athletes that just have the heart defect and nobody knew, um, they've been seeing now that most of them had clubbing. So it has to do with cardiovascular wow. type of stuff. So he requested that we, um, he asked me a few other questions that are related to um, cystic fibrosis, especially digestion. My son had pneumonia when he was in sixth grade that he just couldn't seem to shake, things like that. And so he asked if he could call our family practice doctor and discuss it with her. And after hearing what he had to say, she decided to do testing to rule some things out. At the time, she was sure that it wasn't CF because he was too healthy, which that's something um, that you and I have talked about is people who don't look sick. Mm -hmm. And so uh, anyway, they did the testing and they, to test for cystic fibrosis, it's actually a sweat test. Um, they uh, put little electrodes on your arm and they induce your body to sweat. And then they measure the salt content in the sweat. Oh. 
And not only did his come back positive, it came back really positive. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so they did the second follow-up one and the diagnosis was made that it was CF. And uh, we are very fortunate to have um, a couple of um, highly accredited CF clinics here in the state and ours is in Columbia. And so immediately they explained to us that it was a genetic disorder. So they would have to test the girls and Sarah, same thing. And so within weeks, within a week or two of each other, they were diagnosed. Were you frustrated with your family physician for not noticing more of the markers? Um, you know, I guess initially with our original pediatrician and our family physician for, for missing it. And just briefly, um, when I started doing research and understanding the key, the key things that would flag it, I understood a little bit more how it was missed. Okay. Um, because all of the, the keys were there, such as my daughter had pneumonia five times before she was five. Um, but she also had RSV as a baby. And so that kind of goes together with it. My son had digestive issues. Um, and a few minutes ago, I mentioned that when he was two, CF was brought up. Um, but the number one thing in kids is failure to thrive. Um, they're underweight. They're in that oh, lowest okay. percentile my kids really weren't. And so um, when it was brought up when my son was two, it was because he was having digestive issues. So they made a list of things, celiac. Um, they talked about CF, uh, dairy intolerance, lactose intolerant. And so the treatment for the lactose intolerance helped. So that was a simple treatment. And he was otherwise healthy, like he didn't have any issues going on. Um, so they kind of took that off the table and didn't do the testing because he was better. So just little things like that. And actually my doctor, our family doctor kicked herself, I think more than I did because I think when I realized how rare cystic fibrosis is, I, there are only like 75 people, 75,000 people internationally that have been diagnosed with it. Wow. Uh, about 40,000 yeah. of those are here in the U S and I, I think when I saw those numbers, I thought, well, I can see where yeah. the doctors would miss it. It's not something that stands out. Um, but now uh, let's see. In two, I believe in 2006, 2004, something like that, um, that testing was added to newborn testing in the state of Missouri. Oh, so my kids were just on the yeah. other side of that. Uh, yeah. So hopefully now they catch it faster um, for people. So, yeah. So the frustration was there, but I think also her reaction to it. She didn't just brush it aside. She didn't say, oh, that's absolutely ridiculous. Her response to it was, here's another physician pointing something out to me that I don't have the, the knowledge about that he does. Um, and, and probably it's helpful to mention that that neurologist had done Doctors Without Borders for years. So even though he was a neurologist, he was trained to look for everything. Right. And some doctors aren't. And so I think that, I think had she reacted differently, had she said, oh, that's silly or no, we're not going to put him through that testing or no, I don't think that's a thing. Yes. I think I would have been really. So the compassion was there and the yes, thought. Okay. Yes. Was there much damage to finding it later than if they would have found it earlier? Did they really matter that much? It, it did in some ways, um, some might say we found it just in time. Okay. Um, so my daughter has permanent damage to her small airways in her lungs. And 
CF is so difficult to know. Maybe she would have had that anyway, even with all of the treatments, but she does have um, permanent damage in those, in those smaller airways. Um, my son, uh, you know, yes, I think there are some things that wouldn't have been as much of a struggle for him digestive wise, um, chronic diarrhea, things like that, that he wouldn't have had to have dealt with. So both of them, um, the first thing that generally becomes blocked is your pancreas. Uh, so the kids were not absorbing the nutrients the way that they should. Fortunately in our home, I had a, if you're hungry, eat policy because my kids never gained weight. So <laughs> uh, which now I know why they never gained weight, but, but they were starving all the time. And so I let them eat. So they were actually getting the nutrients they needed. Had I been a parent who had a large fear of obesity or things like that, um, it might've been a different story because I wouldn't have given them the nutrients they needed without realizing mm -hmm. that's what I was doing. Um, the biggest thing was, uh, when they'd started testing, because, um, once you're diagnosed, you work with a team, a CF team, and they see you every three months and they do a sputum culture. Uh, they do all kinds of checking and testing and follow-ups and things like that. And, um, uh, Kyle, my son, um, tested positive for a nasty lung bacteria called Pseudomonas, mm. uh, which gone untreated can cause lots of trouble. And when uh, I asked the doctor what would have happened had this not all transpired when it did, he said, well, the diagnosis would have come in a few months because he would have started being symptomatic and it would have been pneumonia type symptoms and they would have treated him for pneumonia and he would have gotten better, but then he would have gotten sick again. And this time the treatment wouldn't have worked as well. And he said within three to six months, he'd have been in the hospital. And that's where we would have diagnosed the pseudomonas. And by then it would have done permanent damage, most likely to his lungs. So I guess for us, the universe had a plan <laughs> and we found out right then and amazingly enough, too, um, people have seen the movie Five Feet Apart. Um, it's true. CFers can't be within six feet of each other because they carry germs that they can transfer to other CFers um, that you and I aren't. Um, we're more mean, too. We don't we don't have that happen as easily to us. Yeah. And so um, but because my kids are siblings, they don't have to do the six feet apart. Oh, my daughter did not test positive for pseudomonas. So at that time, so how that worked out, cause she would have eventually being exposed to him regularly. Um, my kids were close, you know, they, they played together. They curled up on the couch together. They drank after each other. So, um, those kinds of things could have caused some really serious problems with that, but it didn't for us. How did they handle the diagnosis? Uh, so <laughs> this is where personalities, boy, <laughs> you know, kids' personalities come in. They were both very angry. Oh. Um, it was very confusing to them that suddenly we had to add in all of these medications and all of these treatments uh, that were unpleasant at best uh, to keep them healthy when they didn't feel sick. So... They were both angry. Um, why, why are you telling me this? I'm the same person I was yesterday. I don't feel sick. Things like that. My son is though, he's a very linear matter of fact type of person. So once he processed the information um, and realized that doing the treatments maybe he didn't feel as good as he thought. He came to the conclusion that it is what it is and I'm just gonna have a positive attitude about it. Um, my daughter struggled a little bit more. For one thing, the treatments were harder on her. Um, the, the vest treatment that they have to do, the airway clearance, um, 
You have to strap into this vest that looks a little bit like a life jacket and it feel, fills with air, compresses against you and then shakes you with a vibration. So you're like, uh. oh my gosh. And it does it at different frequencies. Yeah. And um, the first month maybe that she did that because it was getting the stuff up from the bottom of her lungs, it would cause her to throw up every time oh. she did it. And it was miserable for her. Um, so she struggled a little bit more with it, but also God love her. She was, uh, within a two week time period, she was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. Um, she ha- found out she had to wear a brace for her scoliosis and she started at a new middle school where she didn't know anybody. <laughs> so she's a pretty strong woman. I tell you, yes. she handled it all like a champ, but she stayed angry longer than my son did with it. And she was, you know, as parents, the hard part is who do your kids direct their anger toward? Yeah. Us. And we had a discussion. She was just as mad as she could be and, and just so frustrated when I, and I said, honey, we didn't do this to you. We are trying to help you be better. And then she stopped and looked at me and she goes, mom, that's not true. You kind of did. It's genetic. You kind of did do this to us. And I was like, oh crap. Yeah, we did. Not intentionally. Yeah. But you know, but it still kind of um, weighs on you. Yeah. 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 Like we didn't know, we didn't have anybody in our family who'd ever been diagnosed with it. So we didn't know we were carriers. When you, when you say that she acted, was angry, was that your perception or was she able to use, I mean, was she, teenagers don't always have the words that they need. I'm not saying mm-hmm. they don't understand their emotions, but they don't always understand how to connect those and articulate so someone else can understand. So right. how did that, how did she was she very open and close with you like that? Or was it you drug stuff out of her or did she change? It was kind of a combination of both things. Um, she, she said, I'm just mad. I don't want to have to do these things. This is ridiculous. Um, what's the point in doing this stuff? And, um, it just doesn't seem fair that I almost have to be tortured. You know, she had to wear her back brace, um, oh, we started out with her having to wear it almost 20 hours a day, uh, just four hours without somewhere in there, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so she would be snappy with us and, and tell us she was just mad. I'm just mad. I'm just mad at everybody. I'm mad at everything. I'm, I'm, I'm mad at you. I, and I know that doesn't make any sense, but I'm mad at you. <laughs> because you're making me do these things and mm-hmm. I don't care whether it's good for me. It, it hurts and it's upsetting. When, so that was- you know, she, you were saying that the kids didn't feel sick or anything. And when they started the treatments, did they start feeling better and start understanding the difference? Because sometimes your baseline changes when you just deal with something you talk about yes. often yes. people with a high pain tolerance, cause they don't really know any different. So was that kind of similar? It was absolutely. Uh, so I want to say maybe a month, maybe two months into treatment, uh, my son and I were in the backyard and he, we were playing ball and he took in a really deep breath and he said, mom, I I have a question. It's going to sound weird. And I said, Oh, what's that? And he said, when you breathe in really deep, like when you take a really deep breath, use your diaphragm, all that stuff, he goes, do you feel it in the bottom of your lungs? And I said, yes. And he said, oh, that's what that is. That's the first time that I've ever felt my breath that deep. Wow. In my lungs. And so at that point, that was a, that was a turning point for him that Yes, I do feel better with this. Um, taking their enzymes, their digestive enzymes, um, because they have to take pancreatic enzymes to help break down their food. Uh, that was a big one that they weren't hungry all of the time. Um, my daughter said, I just realized what it feels like to actually be full. 
after dinner, like I can't eat. I literally can't eat anymore. I feel full ah. and wasn't hungry before bed, that kind of thing. So yeah, yes, it was a process and they would say those things. And then we would point out the correlation with it. And because of that, I, I do believe those are the reasons my, my kids were always very good about following the rules and doing what they were told and things like that. They, they're, they're just really good kids, but, um, that was what kept them going and started causing them to lose that or helping them. I shouldn't say causing them, helping them lose that anger okay. or the situation. So let's see, they're young adults now. They, they've been through this for several years. What, what does the future look like for them from their perspective that you can see? What, are they nervous about moving forward with this or are they just kind of going through like doing what I'm doing? Um, both. Uh, they are very nervous. They, they do worry about what's going to happen with them. Um, so my son is looking at a liver transplant in the future. Uh, there's no time set on that yet, but, uh, he's in CF related liver failure. Um, and there's no way to know or gauge how fast that's happening. They just keep monitoring it. But he has reached a point where he is not only monitored by a CF clinic, but also by the transplant team at Barnes Hospital in St. Louis. Um, my daughter just finished in March a 22-day hospital stay for a very rare bacteria that somehow got <laughs> into her lungs. Um so I think for them and, and what I see them experience and when they talk about it is it's always there. They don't fixate on it. They don't base their life around it per se, but it has to be a part of things because it's always there. Um, you always have to take your equipment with you anywhere you go. You have to make sure you have your meds. You have to make sure that you stay more hydrated than everybody else. Um, you get tired more easily than people your age. And so it isn't their whole life, but it's a very big part of their life that most people their age don't have to think about. Mm -hmm. um, so it does affect them in the idea that None of us know how long we're going to be here. Right. But on the other hand, uh, something my son says is it's very weird to be dying faster than people my age. And that sounds morbid, but in a way it's not because CF is progressive. So no matter whether you do all of your treatments, um, you take all of your medications, and you're doing all the right things. And for the most part, you should be healthy. And they do. Because some people would say, well, why do you do all that if you don't know? Um, because it does make you feel better in the moment. It helps you enjoy the things more that you're doing when you're doing your treatments and you're doing them correctly. And yet, oftentimes, you're just one bacteria, one mold spore, one virus away from not being where you were. Right. And so uh, I think sometimes that concerns them. Um, but we tried really hard uh, to, when they were diagnosed, once we all got through the shock of it, to just start really embracing life, um, not putting things off like we used to. Let's, let's find the money to take that trip. Let's go play miniature golf today. Um, everybody feels good let's not clean the house. Let's go to the park. Um, so we started doing that. And so because of that, I believe they're able to do that more as adults. So they don't let the, they don't let it stop them from dreaming. Uh, they both would tell you that they just have to dream in a little more realistic realm than everybody else. So 
Uh, but it, it does. It keeps them putting one foot in front of the other in hopes that uh, the next breakthrough in the world of CF might be for them. Yes. Very good. Very good. Well, thank you for sharing. I hope you'll come back and talk more. I think there's more we can discuss next time about how it impacted the family unit. We've kind of got to start on moving into it. And I'd love to talk to the kids too. And, yes. And you know, if someone out there is watching this and you or someone you know has a chronic condition, let's talk about it. Let's destigmatize the issues around chronic conditions and give us all a little more strength and energy internally so we can move forward and and enjoy life with every second we have absolutely absolutely thank you so much for having me trina i really appreciate it thank you be sure you're listening at runradio.net